Good afternoon. I'd like to call this meeting order of the Geneva Historic Preservation Commission for Thursday, March 7th, 2019. Start with a roll call. Hamilton? Here. Heller? Here. Solomon? Yo. Stayson? Here. Zinke? Warner? Here. Chairman Zalman? Here. You have a quorum? Great. Thank you. Okay, I'd like to start with the approval of the meeting minutes for February 19th, 2019. Any comments about the minutes from last meeting? If there are no comments, can I get a motion to approve? I move to approve the meeting minutes from February 19th. Second. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? I abstain. I wasn't there. Okay. Great. Motion passes. Okay. Our next our next item on the agenda is down, downtown zoning update review and recommendation. We're going to start with you, Mr. DeGroote. All right. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, for the benefit of the viewing audience, I'm David DeGroote, Community Development Director. Um, tonight I'll be presenting on the downtown zoning update. Uh, before I do that, I just want to thank you all for taking a special meeting tonight to, to consider this topic. Um, I know we all have busy schedules, so I, I sincerely appreciate you making the extra time this evening. Um, I'll go through kind of a high-level <coughs> overview of the changes that are being proposed. Not all of it will pertain to the HPC, so in those areas I will try to be brief. Um, but the agenda, I'll start off with a brief summary of the downtown master plan. Uh, then I will review the project objectives and the status of the, of the downtown zoning update project. Kind of go over the role of the Historic Preservation Commission in relation to this project. Um, then discuss uh, some examples of barriers that we have with, within our ordinance to uh, development or reinvestment in the downtown area. Cover how we plan to streamline some of our re review processes. Um, and then get into how we did the zoning analysis and came up with the proposed district boundaries and regulations, um, how the regulations will work to protect the existing character of the community. I'll briefly touch on what our non-conforming provisions are so we have an understanding of, of the impact of the proposed changes. And then at the end, I want to go through a few areas uh, with the commission uh, where we'll be seeking specific feedback. Um, those areas will include the mixed high density residential zoning district that's being proposed. Um, some specific areas um, that the working group has made recommendations on that maybe are not consistent with the downtown master plan. Um, some specific areas where through the community workshops that we've held, we, we have some questions that we'd like the commission's feedback on. And then finally, some, some other areas where staff has recommendations um, based on, I guess, additional discovery throughout the, the workshop period. Um, so just to start, a uh, summary of the, the downtown station area master plan it was adopted by the City Council in November of 2012, and then it was later amended in November of 2013. Um, through, I think it was 22 public meetings we, we held uh, during that process, uh, we established a set of goals for the downtown area, five key goals. And you'll see the first one is definitely relevant to the Historic Preservation Commission. Uh, preservation down of downtown's authentic character while accommodating new infill development. Second one is strengthening the downtown's role as a central business district, maintaining downtown as the civic heart of the city, encouraging a diversity of residential development types in and near downtown, and then finally making it easier to get around. Um, with each of those goals, there was a, a set of objectives that was tied to each goal. A goal is usually a general statement about a desirable future condition such as encouraging a diversity of, of housing types in and near downtown, where the objective is a little more measurable, a little more specific, um, providing housing that includes, but is not limited to single family homes, townhomes, apartments, condominiums, affordable senior housing, and affordable workforce housing. So each, each of those five goals has a series of objectives. Um, and then we try to tie those objectives to action steps in the, in the implementation section of the plan. Um, as, 
as the land use directly correlates with our zoning regulations. We went through all of all of the zoning ordinance and development controls we have through the zoning ordinance, the subdivision <coughs> regulations, and it's no surprise that a lot of the implementation steps were to amend um, amend those regulations. Um, in addition, the downtown master plan included a land use plan, which um, you see on the left-hand side here, assigned a color to each property in the study area, and uh, designated a desired future land use. Um, some of them are what's existing today, and some of them proposed change. The downtown plan also identified seven opportunity sites, and these areas were areas where that were identified as like key sites for redevelopment in the downtown. Um, and they included illustrative development concepts um, to kind of illustrate how we'd like to see them developed in the future. Um, so our, our current zoning ordinance and zoning map was adopted uh, comprehensively in May of 1995. Um, it has been updated annually with uh, individual zoning map amendments or planning and developments. Um, but the, the overall regulations have not, have not been comprehensively reviewed. Um, because of that, we have a lot of conflicts between the recommendations of the downtown master plan and the current zoning ordinance and zoning districts. Um, and that, that can really serve as a barrier to reinvestment and redevelopment um, because it re typically requires going through uh, special approvals with the city for new, new projects that are consistent with the downtown master plan. So the, the main project objectives of this update is to bring that consistency between the downtown master plan and the zoning ordinance, uh, to remove those barriers, especially if um, the development would be compliant with the visions outlined in the downtown master plan, and then also to streamline our review processes without compromising quality. Uh, the project team for this um, included city staff. Uh, we had Tesca and Associates as our as our hired consultant, um, and then we had an advisory working group that also helps uh, steer the ship, and that consisted of downtown property owners, business persons, developers, aldermen, commissioners, and Geneva residents. Um, the last part of kind of that that working group and, and initial kickoff included. Uh, seven different focus groups of three to four people. We asked a lot of questions that focused on the current zoning ordinance and how it affects operating a business, expanding a business, or developing a business in the downtown area. Um, and the responses we got uh, were that the length of the time for approvals was too long, um, the number of and process required for special uses is excessive, uh, there should be more flexibility for staff built into the code so they can make decisions on minor changes, and just overall, it was too, too restrictive and more flexibility was desired. So that kind of helped form how we approached the, the changes to the zoning ordinance. Uh, the project status right now is that we have the draft ordinance complete um, that has been on the city's website um, since early January. Uh, we've reviewed the relationship between the existing zoning districts and the proposed zoning districts and try to identify areas of conflict. Uh, we've reviewed the relationship between existing buildings and uses on, on properties and the proposed zoning regulations to, again, make sure we understand what conflicts there are. Um, we've drafted district boundaries, um, and then we started uh, community, community workshops in late January. We've had three so far. The first was kind of geared towards the business community. The second, uh, in mid-February, was uh, more all-encompassing, but also focused more heavily on the residential side. And then the last one, uh, last week, was more of an open house style, where we invited property owners to come in, and if they had any questions regarding their specific properties, we could sit down with them and, and understand what those are. Um, so that process has been really helpful because it's helped us identify uh, some of the questions the community has and some of the feedback we need from, from this commission and the plan commission moving forward. Overall, the draft ordinance expands our uh, administrative approvals. It ex expedites review for minor changes, such as site plan review, consolidates districts um, in the downtown area that essentially have the same purpose. Um, for example, we have, we have several transitional zoning districts 
between um, the core business district and the residential neighborhoods and making those all one district. Um, consolidating permitted and special use lists into more general categories. Adding graphics and reducing text to make the code more user friendly. Reducing our plan review time. Uh, focusing more on form and less on density. And then uh, reducing the need for, for PUD approvals or other special approvals. Um, so that, that brings us to the role of the HPC in this process. Um, I guess as you, as you hear um, the rest of the presentation tonight, uh, consider how we can effectively achieve the city's development objectives within the context of, of the city's historic district. Um, you should also be giving consideration to how the proposed changes relate to the character of the historic district in terms of setbacks, um, building height, overall scale and development patterns. And then there will be uh, some specific questions I have that I'll be seeking feedback from the commission um, for recommendations to the planning commission and city council and then certainly any other recommendations that the commission wants to offer. Um, some examples of how we've proposed to remove barriers. Um, some simple examples here. Restaurants current, currently require a special use permit in the B3 district. The B3 district is South Third Street, um, which is pretty much known as our, our dining district. We've granted 18 special use permits for restaurants in that district. Um, so the conclusion is if you're granting 18 special use permits in a three block area, maybe it's not a special use. Maybe that's the desired land use. So making those a permitted use in the B3 district. Um, our current regulations on the residential side, they, they encourage uh, front porches on homes. We, we give floor area bonuses for front porches, but um, almost every variation request that we have come through over the last decade has been to reduce the street yard setback to allow for a front porch. Um, so, and almost all of those have been granted. Um, so we're proposing a change that would allow an encroachment into the street yard setback for front porches only of up to eight feet. So you wouldn't have to go through that, that variation process to, to have a front porch added to the home. Um, another example of a barrier in the zoning ordinances, we hear a lot that you know Geneva is a, a community that it just screams bed and breakfast, yet we don't have any. And the current regulations are, could be part of the reason why uh, we don't. It's only permitted by a special use permit, and it has to be located in a residential district within 500 feet of the B2 or B3 district on one of the state routes. Um, so when we really study what that geography is, it wound up being like a dozen properties, <laughs> and not all of them are screaming bed and breakfast. <laughs> um, so what we proposed in the ordinance was to just allow them by special use permits in residential districts uh, that would require the public hearing before the plan commission. You'd have to demonstrate that you're not increasing uh, traffic congestion or parking on the street, and that you can accommodate the additional traffic and, and park them. Um, and then we would allow them as permitted uses in commercial and multifamily residential districts um, where you have a, a higher intensity of use. Some examples of how we uh, propose to streamline the review processes. Um, I'll try to go through these quickly. Uh, but consolidating the Planning Commission and Zoning Board of Appeals, I'll elaborate on that a little bit. Um, giving administrative site plan review. Um, and then having some flexibility on use determinations. So the first is the consolidation of the Planning Commission and Zoning Board of Appeals. Right now the Planning Commission considers everything you see on the left-hand side from map amendments to special uses, planning to developments. But the Zoning Board of Appeals has a more limited role. They consider variations to the zoning ordinance, whether it's um, setback relief or additional building height or granting uh, parking space relief. Um, and they also consider appeals of administrative decisions. Um, because they have a more limited role, they don't meet very frequently, where the plan commission typically meets at least once a month. Um, but consolidation is really more efficient um, from an applicant's point of view. Uh, if you look at Grams 318, the expansion that they're, they're currently doing, that required zoning board of appeals review for a variation to reduce the rear yard setback, required a review by this commission, because it's within the historic district, 
It also required review by the planning commission because it was a uh, site plan review. And then it went to the community, the whole and city council. So you had five public meetings for um, an existing business to expand. Um, it's also more efficient from the, the city standpoint because with that process, we have two applications, two meeting schedules, two agendas, two staff reports, and attendance at two public meetings. Um, where if you consolidated the Planning Commission and Zoning Board of Appeals, you would at least eliminate one of those um, for both the, the applicant and, and the city. And that, of course, translates to a cost savings uh, for both parties, uh, not paying public notice for two meetings, not having minutes and transcripts for two public hearings, and then not attending uh, both meetings either. Um, we did survey 50 municipalities uh, in the region, and we found that more than half of them have consolidated um, their planning commission and zoning board of appeals. It's uh, kind of a best practices approach that, that's growing in popularity. Uh, another way we're planning to uh, or proposing to streamline the review process is right now a site plan review is required for any expansion of a building over 25% of the existing area, any new construction of a commercial or multifamily building, or any amendment to a previously approved site plan. And that site plan review requires not a public hearing but a public meeting uh, before the planning commission and ultimately approval by the city council. Um, and that's required even if it's 100% code compliance. So it meets all the setbacks, lot coverage, um, meets the, the standards that the HPC set forth, um, it still has to go through that planning commission and city council uh, approval. So in the draft ordinance, we're proposing to eliminate that requirement um, and say if it, if it meets all the setback and all the bulk regulations um, and it's in the historic district and has, has been approved by the commission that we can administratively approve the site plan if we find it meets the rest of the standards uh, outlined in the ordinance. So that would eliminate two additional public meetings after an HPC meeting. Um, the final example is our use determinations. Um, right now in each zoning district, we have a very specific list of uses that are permitted. And I say very specific, like if um, it's not just retail uses, we, uh, we list an apparel store, an electronics store, a furniture store. And if that use isn't listed, you then have to apply for a text amendment to list your specific use. Um, so that can be really burdensome, especially with the changing nature of retail right now and all the new uses that we see. Um, so what we're proposing is more general land use categories such as retail, office, uh, personal service, and then we can make a, a reasonable interpretation that it's a like use for that zoning district. And if we have any question, then we can bring it to the, the Planning and Zoning Commission for, for their consideration. But otherwise, if we can confidently say it's a similar use, we can move forward. Um, so now I just want to provide a little bit of background on how we came up with the proposed regulations and how we drew the, the zoning district boundaries. Um, went about it a few different ways. Um, one of them was by looking at the opportunity sites where we had kind of these um, development concepts. This is uh, Stevens and 31, so you've got you know, Park Place here now and the First Street Row Homes here now, which is pretty similar to what was conceived of in the, in the plan. Uh, but when we look at those developments and we looked at the current zoning regulations, we found that the required lot area was too low for the plan density. Maximum lot coverage was too low. Um, the building height of 35 feet was too low uh, for rear loaded townhome units. Um, excuse me. And then the, the maximum floor area ratio was too low for the planned structures as well. Uh, we also looked at the character images within the downtown master plan um, for increased density in and around the downtown. Uh, these images were selected by a, a preference survey through the downtown master plan process. Uh, so they weren't just kind of tossed in there. They were selected uh, through that participatory process. And looking at kind of what those setbacks look like, what those building heights look like, um, and trying to trying to kind of work those into the regulations as well. We also looked at how density has changed in Geneva since the master plan was approved in 2013. On the left-hand side, these are 
uh, kind of quick and easy dot density maps, but there's 15 different sites represented here, and the red dots reflect the, the units, the dwelling units that were on those sites in 2013. And on the right-hand side, um, you can see we've added quite a bit of density on those 15 sites. Um, and then we looked at how, how that was achieved. Um, so in 2013, we had 11 single-family homes and four apartment units on those sites for a total of 15 dwelling units. Um, uh, since then, we've added uh, 30 single-family homes, 57 townhomes, eight duplexes, and 22 apartments for a total of 117 dwelling units. So a, a net increase of 102 units, um, 97 of those required some special approval through the city, um, mostly through planning and development approval. Seven different PUDs uh, were required to, to add that type of density. So we looked at those, we looked at those PUDs and we tried to find what, what the common ground was. Um, when we added over 50 townhome units through seven PUDs, we found a lot of similarities in the rear loaded units. Um, the need to increase the building height above 35 feet to accommodate uh, the garage and then two floors above that. Um, the need to reduce the street yard setback so you can provide a driveway in the back to access the rear loaded garage. Um, so trying to take that into consideration when we drafted the regulations for what we're calling the, the mixed density residential district. Um, I don't know if you probably can't see it well on the screen here, but we've got kind of two standards in that district. So if you're a front loaded unit, um, the maximum building height remains the same at 35 feet. Um, and the minimum required setback is 20 feet from the, from the street. So you could still pull a car off the street in front of the garage. Um, but if you are gonna have a rear loaded unit, um, then you could reduce that street yard setback to 10 feet and increase your building heights up to 40 feet. And we'll have some more discussion on that number in a little bit. Another step we took is we, we found about half a dozen areas where we thought there was a high probability for conflict. So in those areas, we did a property by property analysis, looking at existing buildings and uses, comparing them to the, not only the proposed zoning regulations, but the existing zoning regulations, and then trying to identify the conflicts and noting where the proposed zoning was either more restrictive or less restrictive. And in that process, we found uh, the working group found there was some areas where the proposed changes really didn't make sense and needed to be changed, and we've made those changes. In other areas, we found that it was a really a good match. Um, and in some areas, it might not have been a good match, but it was the desired change uh, if the property were ever to redevelop. So at, after all of that, um, we were able to consolidate the, the 18 zoning districts in the study area that exist today down to seven zoning districts. And we'll go through um, some of those in a little bit of more detail. Um, but before we do that, I wanted to just uh, talk about some of the regulations that are in the zoning ordinance that will work to protect the existing character um, of the residential areas. Uh, what we have in our zoning ordinance today, we refer to as the teardown infill regulations. Um, so we try to ensure compatibility with surrounding properties in terms of setbacks lot coverage, height, floor area, and garage location, <clears throat> how many garage doors face the street. Uh, we provide floor area bonuses if you have a rear loaded garage, side loaded garage, or a detached garage in the, in the rear yard. Uh, we require new infill development to take the average setback of the adjoining houses on e either side and use that as their minimum setback. So we're having some consistency with how far buildings are set back from the, the street. All of those regulations are being carried over into the residential districts, so we haven't lost uh, what will be referred to as the teardown infill regulations. We have transitional setback requirements in the non-residential areas, so you have increased setback requirements for multifamily uh, residential development or non-residential developments if it's adjacent to a single-family district. Um, so not only an increased setback requirement, but there's landscaping requirements that go along with that to provide a, a kind of a screening and softening between those, those uses. Um, 
We're also proposing to allow residential uses in what we're referring to as the residentially scaled commercial mixed use district. Um, so these are, uh, these are kind of the side streets, Hamilton, uh, James Street, some of the areas where we have commercial uses and um, converted single family homes, but we also have single family homes in those districts. Uh, right now we don't allow single family homes as a permitted use in those districts, but we're proposing to allow that. And that might help reduce the development pressure for new infill development. Um, it might also help us, uh, I guess, fill some of those vacancies in those areas where we're maybe not getting office and commercial uses. Um, one of the concerns we've heard through the community workshops is um, you know, if, if we were to allow, as it's proposed, the, the mixed density residential district would allow six unit townhome buildings um, by right. And if we were to do that, um, there would be some, some serious pressure um, in these neighborhoods and you could have a house demolished and six units go in its place. Um, but that's not likely um, because the construction of a six unit townhome building would likely require the assemblage of two or three lots um, with the regulations as they're proposed and that's about half of a city block face um, and then you also have the historic district uh, pr protection so you'd have to demonstrate that on those two or three lots you can demolish two or three of those structures to make room for these these new townhomes um, that requires a public hearing so you'd have notice going out to, to surrounding property owners and an ability for them to uh, testify why they they should be uh, saved and then even if even if the buildings were demolished then you still have the layer of review by the HVC to make sure that new development is reviewed um, to be compatible in terms of material size scale and proportion um, I'll get to the interactive part one minute <laughs> forgive me um, before I do that though I want to talk about our non-conforming provisions because that word's going to come up quite a bit um, a non-conforming use, meaning if um, it exists today but it would not be allowed by right in the proposed zoning district, that can be continued indefinitely. Um, a non-conforming use can't be expanded, um, so you can't put an addition on and expand the use into that space. And once it's discontinued, it can't be reestablished. Re so if it's um, a commercial use in a, in a residential district, once it goes residential, it can't go back to commercial. Um, but discontinued only happens when that change of use occurs. So it, if you were to close up your shop and market the property, you could still market it as a commercial use. Um, but once it, once it goes to a residential use, then it can't go back. And then there's non-conforming structures. Um, which might not comply with proposed lot coverage restrictions, building heights, or setbacks. Um, you're allowed to do ordinary re repairs and maintenance to non-conforming structures. Um, they can be expanded, provided that the, the expansion complies with the new regulations. Um, they can be restored if destroyed by fire or other act of God, provided that the restoration cost doesn't exceed 50% of the uh, cost of restoration for the entire building. Any questions on non-conforming provisions? Okay. Um, so this is an area that we'd like to get some feedback from the commission on. Um, and I'm going to go th give you an overview of it, and then I think it would probably make sense to come back to it in a few minutes after we go through two of the areas where the proposed zoning is. Um, but this is that mixed high-density residential district. Um, again, this would allow for the reduced setback if it's a rear loaded townhome unit um, down to 10 feet, which is consistent with what we've approved in seven planning developments. And then a maximum building height of 40 feet um, if it's a rear loaded unit. Um, 40 feet, we don't, none of the PUDs we've approved have gone as high as 40 feet. I think one had 39 and a half feet, another was 38 feet two inches. Another, I think, was 37. I think we had one that was able to, to do it within 35 feet. 
Um, so that building height, um, I think we could have some discussion on that in a few minutes, um, as well as the, the reduced setback. Um, but also the, the permitted uses. I'd like to get the commission's uh, feedback on that as well. In this district, um, you would be allowed to have a single family home, uh, single family attached up to six units, so side by side uh, row homes, uh, duplexes, three flats, uh, group homes licensed by the state, that state statute, um, public utility and service uses. So we have some existing transformers and stuff. Uh, parks and recreational uses and then home occupations, which is a you know, home office without outside advertisement signage uh, guests coming in. One of the concerns that was brought up through the community workshop um, portion of this was whether or not these these side by side attached single family homes should be allowed by right uh, or if they should require a special use. So if you're having a development of up to six townhomes, should that be a special use in these areas? And I think like the commission's feedback on that after can when we kind of review the geographic area. Um, so those are areas I've left blank. I'm waiting for your feedback. So two of those areas. Um, the first, excuse me, the first is on south side of James Street between 7th and 5th. Um, the section that has R5 and kind of has the light green hash marks on it. Um, the downtown master plan showed this area is single family residential. And when the working group reviewed this, um, we had some questions on why it was shown as single family residential um, because the existing zoning allows for two and three family units. And then when we looked at the existing uses, uh, you had half of the properties were already either two or three family units and the others were, were single family homes. Um, and when we looked at the proposed regulations for the single family districts, we found that eight out of the 10 properties would be non-conforming with the proposed requirements. Um, the most common reasons were the maximum lot coverage was too low in the single family district. Minimum lot sizes and widths were too low in the single family district, but um, not too low in the existing R5 or the proposed mixed density residential district. Um, here's some images of properties within that area on South James Street. So these, these units have multiple units in them. Uh, these are single family homes. Um, so the working group, when we looked at this area, their recommendation was to, um, I guess, go against the recommendation of the downtown master plan um, and keep the existing mixed density uh, in that area and, and go with the mixed density residential district. Um, the reasoning for that was that it was consistent with the existing zoning and land uses. Um, it's consistent with the goal of the downtown plan to encourage the diversity of residential housing types in and near the downtown. Um, it's consistent with the, the objective that goes with that, which is to provide housing that includes uh, a wide variety, uh, single family homes, townhomes, apartments, affordable workforce housing. Um, the thought was also that if, if we're preserving the density we do have, um, that we might be reducing development pressures in other areas for, for density and living near the downtown area. Um, so I have Google Earth available too if you want to do kind of a walkthrough of that district, you know, from the street view we could do that, but um, I'd like to open that up for discussion with the commission and see how we feel. I think the, the original recommendation, I went through the minutes the best I could from a few years ago, and I think the original recommendation to keep it single family uh, was tied to historic preservation. And the idea being that you might have um, more owner occupancy in single family homes and preserving these historic structures. Um, but in the working group's review and looking at uh, properties in the area, some of the two flats were m much better maintained than single family homes, so I don't, I don't know if that logic always applies. No problem. <laughs> the biggest 
difference between the two is is really the density of because it, it doesn't preclude using a single family home within that district if that it, it's not prohibited correct right so it's just an opportunity to go with a higher density if if yeah. it were pulled together I would say that the overall density isn't even different because you both the current and proposed zoning requires a minimum of 3,250 square feet per unit. Um, so you'd have to have a lot size large enough to accommodate six units or three units, um, or you'd have to assemble enough and then demolish the existing structures to, to increase the overall density. Um, again, I don't, again, I don't think density is the right word, but the number of units. Yeah. Um, so I guess the biggest difference is, is that the existing zoning allows for single family, two family, and three family, where the proposed would allow for single family, two family, three family, and then maybe the townhomes up to six units. And that, that again, could be by permitted or special use, depending on how the commission feels on, on that issue. Does anybody have any comments about that specifically? It's such a go ahead. Well, I, yeah, I do I have a question regarding a change in zoning. Does that jeopardize the existence of any existing property in that particular area? Well, I would imagine it, it, it conceivably could but they'd still have to get a demolition and go through the process of demolition permitting right. to do that, right? Right, so um, I mean, all, all of these lots have structures on them and all of these lots are within the historic district. Um, so any, any assemblage and demolition would require review by this commission um, in order to put up higher, higher density. Um, I guess there's there's kind of two questions laced into this area and the, and the next one. Um, I guess the first being, should the area ideally be single family in in the future, or or are we trying to preserve some of the density and uh, diversity in housing that we have, and keep it as a mixed a mixed district? Um, and then the second question is, within that mixed district, should side-by-side -side townhomes be allowed by right or only by special use? Sorry. Yeah. I don't know how to turn this one off. It, it seems to be quite a hypothetical. Hello? It seems to be. Hello? <laughs> It seems to be quite a hypothetical, but you know, it, it, I guess it, it it does dovetail into your actual master plan. Is that the idea behind changing the the density available at that point? Is that because I'm, I'm it? I, I think it, it, it's a difficult question because the the, ma the master plan has multiple objectives goals okay. and objectives um, one is to increase density uh, one is to preserve the historic character uh, another is to diversify the types of housing we have mm -hmm. um, so uh, again the downtown plan if you just looked at the land use plan showed this as being a single family so what's what's been proposed by by the working group is not really consistent with simply that plan but they found consistency with other goals and objectives of the plan which is keeping that diverse type of housing mm -hmm. um, um, and really adjacent to the core commercial areas of the downtown. And then again, looking at the existing uses and existing zoning, um, it's, not, it's not really a substantial change. 
It's currently zoned R5? It's currently zoned R5, correct. So the proposed would only add the option of a townhome? Right. right. And everything that's there is grandfathered in. And the townhome would be, under current zoning, uh, an exception? Uh, would Co require? Uh, under the current zoning would require rezoning. It, it would not be allowed at all in the district. But it could go in as a PUD, though, correct? Um, and not even a PUD, because you'd have to first rezone it and then apply for a PUD. So um, I guess the option for the commission to consider is if we're not comfortable with the townhome by right, you could list it as a special use within this district, which would require some additional scrutiny. I would, I would vote for that I mean, at, at a minimum, I too. I, yeah. I mean, I, I think this falls in that category you mentioned earlier, that the likelihood of somebody coming in and being able to tear down three houses in a row to do that is, is unlikely, but um, I, I don't, uh, I, I think you're getting a little too close to the residential area when you do that with, uh, with your townhomes. I, I just, I, you know, I, I think even though I'm I, looking at the Peyton Street area, I, would, I was a little concerned about the height differences over there too. That's the next area we'll be looking at. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, the um, yeah, I, I'm I'm afraid also by by making it by right, that it makes it an encouragement. <laughs> I mean, is is that does the commission agree? Yes. On that on that point. Yeah. Thank you. Sorry, go ahead. No, I was just saying it makes it too friendly, I think. I think in some circumstances that's exactly what we're trying to achieve with the downtown zoning update. Right. If, if this is the development pattern we want to see, let's make the regulations align with it and encourage it. And I guess this is kind of one of those areas where there was mixed feelings on what, what should be allowed. Um, is there a difference in uses available to the uh, the new mixed high density versus the it, existing zoning that's there now and the uh, and the zoning that it would be if it wasn't the mixed high density which would be that would be probably scale residentially scaled commercial mixed use is that is that where would it fall down to if it weren't mixed use high density so if you're comparing um, go back here if you're comparing the permitted uses to the existing R5, mm -hmm. uh, I tried to put that in bold. I guess it didn't really show up well. Okay. But it's the single-family attached units that, up to six units, that would not be allowed in the existing zoning district. Yeah. Either by right or by special use. Yeah. Um, otherwise, the the permitted uses are identical. Um, if you were to go with the land use plan of going to single-family residential, it would be. It would be this list, but single family only. You take out the two family, three family, and attached units. So, what's the alternative moving forward for proposed zoning? Um, other than um, the mixed high density, it doesn't. It, 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 is that I, is, if I'm understanding? Is that the question? It, would it be single family, medium density, and right. then uh, listed uh, per, as a permitted use? As a it would be um, if you were to, to go with the single family medium density. It would be these permitted uses, and you would take out. I get any of the any of the multiple dwelling unit options, which are existing on half the properties, right? Why? Why wasn't it considered to be residentially scaled commercial mixed use with commercial being? across the street was it just acted as a barrier to, to act as a buffer between the two districts well the uh right the the commercial the residentially scaled commercial district is on the north side of james mm -hmm. um 
and there really aren't any commercial uses on the south side. They're all residential uses. Um, so it, the residentially scaled commercial district is kind of viewed as that transitional district into the residential area, which began on the south side of James Street. Was it was it ever a thought to make it into the the residentially scaled commercial mixed use? It, it really wasn't. Um, I think those are areas where we, we still see a lot of mixed use in the transitional districts where we have some offices, some residential. Um, those are areas we also have a hard time filling uh, filling because everybody wants to be on state or third. Mm -hmm. um, understandably, I mean, there's more visibility yeah. there. So the, the occupancy on James across the street is not, it's available on James across the street, if you will. But the commercial mixed use, there's there's not high demand I guess not a high for, demand for, the for, side for that right. for that side street yeah. yeah and yeah I, does anyone ever does anyone have any additional comments about that just I think it seems to be the commission's consensus that it would be all right to have it there, but on a special use. special use, I guess. Is that is that would that be correct? So it's allowed, but has to go through an additional process. So to keep the mixed density residential, but require a special use permit for anything beyond three units. Correct. Yes. Does, does anyone agree with that? Yeah, if I remember correctly, that Fourth and Campbell, uh, this commission was less than unanimously enthusiastic about that, and and it would appear that you're going for the similar type of proposed zoning by right for this entire section. Okay. So I, I think I concur with with Paul's uh, okay. evaluation there. What what was that zone before? Did they have to go? Th I think th that was actually zone commercial, and then had to be rezoned to residential. Okay. Um, because of the the fact that it was historically commercial property. <clears throat> yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, I think we can probably come back to the bulk regulations then after we review the next area. Um, which uh, Commissioner Hiller pointed out. We've got a similar situation on the north side of the downtown area where we have some existing R6 zoning um, along North 6th North Street and then all along the south side of Peyton Street. Um, this is an area that is proposed for the same zoning district, the mixed high density residential. And that's a recommendation, again, from the working group uh, that's not consistent with the downtown master plan that showed it as single-family residential. They sh the land use plan showed all of this as single-family. Um, but this, is, again, is an area when we took a closer look at it, um, we found that most of the properties would be non-conforming with the single-family zoning requirements, again, due to lot sizes um, being too small, lot widths being too small, Set, existing setbacks uh, violating uh, the minimum side yard setback, street yard setback, um, and then lot coverage not being high enough uh, either. And then within this specific area, we found that 22 out of 55 of the properties already have multiple dwelling units, either two flats or three flats. And we go through um, some images just to show you those. Uh, here's some examples of the multiple units. Well. I would say the house on the left is mine and it's not multiple units. It is not. Okay. It shows up with two addresses. No? I, I think one of the ones that was on James Street also currently is in it. Okay. The multifamily. Okay. We could revise those. Um, some more that have multiple units and some single family homes in the area. I 
have it as single family. So again, the, the working group um, had similar recommendations in these areas, uh, came to the same conclusions that if we're trying to increase density near and downtown, we should preserve the density that we have, um, keep the diversity of housing types, some of the rental units we have in the downtown area. Um, I guess kind of the same questions as, as the last area we looked at. Do we think that the, the mixed density is appropriate for this area? And if so, do we think that anything beyond three units should be a special use? I, I would say my, my, my concern, not just with this area because I live in this area, but the amount of um, properties, that the number of properties, the amount of space that is being proposed for that mixed high density it, it, it just seems like it's a lot. It's, it's going to drive a lot more density into the area that the character is a very single family um, a very single family area. And, and I would I would hate to see the multi-unit, six unit, ever go in and change change the character of those of those um, blocks could you go back to the slide that showed that the multiple unit on the blue the um, yeah, yeah it, um, go. forward a couple more one more from there that that's that that's was fun. the one that map because it, it, it almost seems like if if you were south of or west of Fifth Street is more of the issue, or west of Fourth, I should say, is more of the issue than than the whole area. And you've only got a a few as you get east of there. Yeah, there's a few that are east of there, but is one of those your property? Is it at third and I'm at, I'm at fourth and Payton. Fourth and Payton. So we know that one's so, yeah, that one's actually no. a single oh, west. That okay. one. Okay. Yeah. Is that is it do you take up all three lots there or just the one just lot? A corner. But it's, it's it's again it's I don't want to just focus on that. It, oh no, it, I, I, it's I, I, just the number of blocks and the amount of properties and it it just seems it seems to me like it's over time, it's going to change the character of that northern historic yeah. district. It's it's pushing a lot more density right. these, to me. These are non into very single family character homes. But they're non conforming because of uh, because of setback and and, and and density. Is that how they're non conforming? Are they're, they're not they're currently they're family? The the current zoning is R six, which allows for two family and three family units. Okay, but um, so. If it were to go to single family, yes, a lot of properties would become non-conforming in terms of use and setbacks and lot coverage. But, um, but, but by scale, they all fit. I mean, that's just it. If you put in something that's larger than what's there now, characterized in scale, it, it, it right. would not work so, with neighboring houses. I guess kind of similar to the last area we looked at, if, if that's to be considered, should that only be considered by a special use permit where you are taking a hard look on the impact of the character of the area? Um, yeah, I mean, I think that that that, that kind of dovetails into the, the another thing that that caught my thought is is you you say that in a and it's it's really the bulk it, it goes into the bulk portion of it so maybe I'll hold my comment until then uh, but I when this this district was drawn it it almost seems like it I could almost see it going to the west of Fifth Street and not to the east of Fifth Street <laughs> because it seems like that, that all tends to be, and and the character, and maybe it's even Sixth Street over because it, it 
I could see allowing that sort of thing, but I think the the character and the block between the the other blocks are just all very residential feeling and not not as. Well, um, that's certainly something the commission can can recommend is altering the boundaries if if you feel that um, you know mixed density is appropriate west of Fifth Street, but maybe single family should be the desired land use pattern east of Fifth Street. Um, and as long as there's consensus from the commission, that recommendation can advance. I see a marked difference, though, from the, the slides we saw, even of the, the two in three that exist now, compared to what a six might be for an image. These, uh, without exception, I saw everything there still had primarily a residential character. And, and I, I, uh, I, my conception of six units or so does not seem to be in keeping with the same type of character that exists there now. So your point about change of character, uh, I, I guess, hits home yeah. to me as well. It, it would be a marked difference from what currently we're seeing, yeah. even in the R5 and R6, which does allow for multifamily, just not six units. Yeah. yeah. And to be clear, that's what I was trying to say. I didn't say it very well, but. Well, I don't know if I did either. But, uh, well, two, and, two and three family, I, within the character of the, right. the, the neighborhood, I, I'm, I have no issue with it's so I, longer term and six units and I think I, I hear consensus on that is is there consensus to allow it by special use permit uh, see I, I think I would almost want to I, I I look at it as almost the the town home with it it wants to be an almost an edge and I know that 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 orange is is already somewhat of an edge because it goes from that that's the mixed use residential scale correct right and then it goes to the high density and then to the residential but i would almost say that the the edge would be more of you know either west of sixth street or something to that character but it's still i, I don't know whether anyone has any opinion about that at all or whether I'm just uh, that's my personal opinion so sure Are we how many how many houses in the North District are non-conforming. In relation to what? Into the standards. Like, you know, I mean, we're seeing more and more, we're seeing more change in the North District where people are, some people are wanting to rehab, but we're also seeing people that want to tear down. And so if you have, I mean, I guess from my own you know, my own point of view, it's just my own point of view from where I live in the, down, in, the, in the historic district is that you're seeing a lot of people that are more upset with the fact that we have so many townhomes coming into the downtown area. And as was mentioned here, when you talk about keeping the authenticity of the downtown area, um, I think you lose that potential. Um, when you start putting in too many townhomes. I mean, maybe I'm off track with what I'm saying right here, but if you have three non-conforming homes in the North District and by some chance they haven't been taken care of and it's demolition by neglect, then you have the possibility of a developer coming in and building six units or whatever, three or, I mean, however it goes. I don't know the details, like I'm just, asking those questions. I guess I'm just confused on that because I know that Campbell Row was such an issue in the neighborhood I live in, um, not only with density, um, but with also the building height. And I know you're going to get to building height. Thank you. I, I think that's 
part of the issue right there. I, I, you said with uh, this uh, mixed high density residential, you could go 37 to 40 feet depending on the setback. What? Uh, 35 I, to 40, um, depending to 40. on the orientation of a townhome unit. Which, which to me, uh, you know, bordering that height, bordering on, on the, the residential, just seems to be a little overwhelming. And that seemed to, that's the argument for every townhome that's been going in that people can buy always have always been complained about the height. Exactly. And that's, so, I, I tried to provide a little bit of that, of that background of the townhomes that we have built, um, what, we, what we have wound up approving. Right. And if there's a sense from the commission that some of those are too tall, I mean, that's some of the feedback we need on, on, the, on those bulk regulations is, is above 38 feet too, too, too tall? Is it above 37? Um, but I think... We also have to balance that with the objectives of adding units where we can. Um, and not that we want to become a, a townhome community, but in the event that there is an opportunity for one, if it goes through Historic Preservation Commission review and a special use permit process and complies with the bulk standards we've set, um, are we going to trust those processes? Right. Well, I, I think most of them up to this point have been within uh, current regulations, right? I don't think we've made any, there have been any, any variations to the height on? Uh, all, all of the townhomes that we built have had some zoning relief. Oh, by height? By height, with the exception of Campbell Row, I don't think needed relief on the height, and I don't think the First Street townhomes, um, the ones that are under construction across from Park Place, I don't think that those needed, needed it either. I don't, I don't know if it's possible. One of the things that has come out of some of the townhome discussions, at least in two cases I can remember, um, was the question about depressing the um, lower level down a half a level instead of building it at current grade, and that helped reduce the scale but still allowed the, the overall height that they needed. So, for instance, uh, not to pick on any particular one, but uh, the 7th Street uh, townhomes and the proposal for the Hamilton Place up on the old Seatron property the comment that came out, out of both of those cases from the commission was, could the developer look at suppressing or depressing that first floor down a half a level? Uh, still would give them the overall height at the, at the rear, but it would give a more, uh, again, the scale of the neighborhood at the street face. Uh, I don't know if that's a possibility to incorporate, but that's, that's been consistent out of your discussion on the last two townhomes we've looked at. I guess, and that begs the question of, of is it a sunken first floor or is it a maximum building height of something less to, to force that issue? Okay. Can, can I ask, what's the difference between the mixed high density residential and the multi, multiple family residential? So the multiple family residential would allow for more than six units. So it's more of your uh, apartments, condominiums. Um, or more than six row homes attached, so 9, 10, 11 in a row, yeah. Thank you. Um, if you have something specific on, on this portion of it, you can you can speak to that, and and we will be able to we'll be able to stop and get your comments whenever you feel you can. Um, when you want to add something to that specific area. Thank you. Okay. I'm Dave Shepard. I live at 117 North Fifth Street, uh, just around the corner from Mr. Hamilton. Uh, and uh, and in a duplex, uh, <clears throat> I don't have any conceptual plan uh, difficulty with the need to update city codes periodically and and what's going on, but I would like to focus my comments on s specifically the Peyton Street uh, mixed use high density things, uh, as you have all inferred I mean the historic nature of of Geneva is is what Geneva is all about it's it's draws people to come to our community and it is a single-family 
presentation. And the houses that are there, a number of the duplexes that you see here, it's because they put a, a unit over the top of the garage uh, that, that somebody is not living in the house, but they've got a second unit behind them, uh, and uh, or a coach house, or whatever they want to, to refer to it as, but it's still got very strong single family presentation. And in and, and our duplex, it's, it's a definitely a single family, and from the street, you wouldn't know it's not a single family. Uh, it's got very much of that single family presence, and, and I urge that. Um, you talk about the compatibility uh, feature and, and you you speak that there still needs to be a compatibility uh, I I look no further than the townhouses on 7th behind cocoa bean there was no compatibility component of those townhouses at all with with the neighborhood uh, and, and so if you allow even as a special use, if you allow the multifamily, the row houses, the six unit row houses into the historic district, you're undermining the arguments of it being a lack of compatibility because you've already identified that it is an existing or a proposed can, can be an acceptable usage. So you're, you're undermining your own basic argument. You're undermining the, the day basis of our, our community. I, I can only urge you to, to recommend the, the elimination of the, the row houses uh, as a basic zoning product uh, for the historic district. They don't, there were no row houses in the original historic district. Uh, save for the muse that they may now qualify. I don't know if they're 50 years old or not. Uh, but, uh, but everything else, we're, we're surrounded by multifamily, uh, the historic district. We're getting more multifamily around the historic district, uh, and that's meeting it. One specific question that I had, and I don't know if you can put a qualifier on it, that 10-foot set back for front porches that can be modified, can you make sure that that doesn't apply to new construction in the townhouses that they're putting up or in town, but only to an existing historical structure? Uh, I mean, there's no limitation. I, oh, here, we want to put our, within 20 feet, we're going to put in our, our new construction. Oh, and now I want a 10-foot front porch variance. Uh, okay. Wait a minute. That's shouldn't be they put that into the the basic plan of the house uh, I've said enough okay I, I do have one question for you though yes. and the what is your opinion of the the character of the muse do you think it fits with the city of Geneva historic district I do not think it is representative of the historic district. Okay. No. Uh, I find that its height, its setback is not egregious. Uh, I find that the setback for the, the townhouses uh, on on Seventh Street behind Coco Bean to be absolutely uh, yeah, egregious I, to the it, whole. That my essence. my point was try to try, try to look at what what would you and not not to but to get an opinion about the muse itself. You know, not not really. Okay. But, Others. So so you don't find the height of and the setback of the muse to be as egregious. For the, against the character of the, do you agree with that or no? I, I would agree that it's not egregious, okay. but it's, it it's still doesn't, not it's, in it, keeping it, it, it with, doesn't the fit with the character. And okay. it's a matter of opening the door. And okay. once you open the door, yep. it's open. Yep. Okay. That. Thank you for your comments. So, so the current R six would not allow for townhomes now. 
Only it would be a special special use. That's no, that's correct. It, it would not allow for townhomes. You'd have to rezone it to what is currently our R seven district. Okay. And and I would assume that you'd still be able to do that within the new. I mean, it, there'd still be a vehicle to change zoning even after this plan is put together and, and codified, right? That's correct. Yeah, but as as it's drafted, the um, the new multifamily district allows for more density than the current R7 zoning district does. So the reason the townhomes were put into this mixed density area is because they were of a smaller scale than an apartment or condo building okay. um, might be. Um, I guess in, in my opinion, if, if we think that they're not of the established character of the district, that's, that's what a special use is for. I, I think you are, you have the nine standards against a special use that you evaluate a project on. It's impact on traffic, impact on character of the area. You have architectural appeal, uh, making sure it's consistent with the, the character of the area. Um, so it's, it's relying on these public bodies, the Historic Preservation Commission and Planning Commission to evaluate a project against those nine standards and find out if, you know, figure out if it really is uh, detrimental to the character of a, of a certain part of the neighborhood. Um, and they can always recommend modifications throughout that process to, to make it. Yeah, I would disfavor uh, townhomes in, in that area. I like the word wording of, uh, uh, what was that, residentially scaled, right? You can get two single family, two and three family residentially scaled, but you can't residentially scale a six family, and I think that's a, that's a horse of another color. It's completely different. It's inconsistent with a historic district, residential historic district. So is that to not allow it at all? Uh, or not allow it by right? Not allow it by right, but by exception. By so it would be allowed by special by use? By special use. Yeah. I would, but I would, it's a, I would, you would have to see what it would look like, or you'd look at the plans and what the special use would be. But I wouldn't disallow it by right, but have a special use for Understood. it. Chairman Zelmer, I think you have someone who wants to make a comment also. Yes. My name is Patty Lane. I'm at 516 Ford. Um, and I just want to make a, a comment that I, my opinion is I wish you would stick with the uh, master plan that they worked hard on, you know, turning this area back to R3. Um, that business to uh, residentially scale that's kind of your buffer zone I really don't think you need two buffer zones um, it's a residential neighborhood it's going to ruin the character of it um, I can see um, 6th Street up to Burgess Norton I could see that having these kind of uh, principles applied um, that makes sense because you're trying to buffer the factory um, but uh, if you look at most of the homes that have had a lot of money invested in them, renovating them and fixing them, they've been um, taken back to single family homes. And there's a uh, huge demand for single family homes in town. Everybody wants to live in town. And um, so of the homes that have been being fixed up, you know, in the area, you know, they're staying single family. The other thing is besides your house, I think there's a couple other errors in the blue uh, markings, you know, showing what's multifamily existing. Um, so, uh, and then also to take into consideration um, the part here that's uh, R3, if you look at the amount of um, multifamily that is in there, it's about the same as Peyton and um, Ford and, and, you know, the west side. Um, here so it's really the same thing but you're making you know Peyton pay the price and you know remain in this our zoning um, when in reality the rest of the neighborhood has kind of similar um, makeup so um, th having that double so the main point is having that double B2 
residentially scaled and then also having the R6 just seems redundant from a protection standpoint, you know, or a blending. Um, so I don't agree with any of the six unit or townhomes um, and I wish that they would follow the plan of going back to R3. It'll ruin the character of the neighborhood. It is all single family, you know, residents. So um, that's my opinion. Thank you for your Thank comments. You. Um, of, of the, uh, it says 55. Now, how are these determined to be multifamily? You just said two, if they have more than one address, is that what you're using? We did, um, we did look at the addresses and then uh, we tried to verif field verify most of them and obviously made a few errors. Okay. Um, we, this study area originally included, um, I think it was 98 or 102 properties because it included areas that were outside of the historic district. So I've modified the numbers based on, you know, just this geographic area within the historic district for the sake of this commission. Okay. I guess, I guess the question to the commission, if we can come up with a consensus of does the, do we feel that it should stay the, uh, single family medium density residential, which is per the master plan, correct? Is that is that what the master plan had in it? The, right, the land use plan showed it as single family medium density. Um, so the question is, does it stay as that? that and the, or all do or we, part? or all of it, or do we look at part of it being either the west of Sixth Street or something to that effect being being able to be the higher density, what's the commission's feeling on that? Can, what does the medium density mean again? The medium density single family? So, yeah. It's, it's basically the existing zoning that you have in all this R3 area. Um, it's been renamed to show that we studied the area, but the, the regulations otherwise don't change. So that means so 8,400 square foot lots, 60 feet of frontage. Um, I think it's a 25 foot rear yard setback. Your stand, standard in town single family lot. Right. But would it allow for two and three family? Not. But it would be grandfathered in for what's there now. Right. What would be the two and three family version of that? to not allow the six, is it just to, to not allow townhomes, but to be able to have multifamily? Um, is I, there guess, a, I guess that's where the special use question comes in, because we don't have a district that is kind of a, a tweener, you know, between single family, two and three family, and then townhomes. You can make a commercially scaled two and three family, new district, new color. Residentially scaled commercial mixed use is that? <laughs> no, I'm. Oh. <laughs> I mean, I guess that's where I'm feeling a little at odds with all of these mixed high density residential. They feel sandwiched between the residentially scaled commercial and the single family, and it. I mean, at the end of the day. I'm I'm okay with using the special use. I I, I support the multifamily. I mean I I think the mix and and is is a, a is special use a special use to go to the six mm -hmm. units townhome. Sorry. Yeah, and anything more than three. Six. Yeah. Anything more than three. So does that mean it would go orange, if you will, <laughs> or the? Uh, it, no, would, it would all still remain this. A single family this, medium density this no um, if we're talking about the the mixed density residential district and a special use for anything more than three units right. um, it just means that you would have to apply for a special use permit and have your plans approved by the HPC plan Commission and City Council hmm. um, but and something would have to get demoed yeah right you still have only a couple of lots still so. have that yeah well that, that would have to happen no matter what though right. 
Well, uh, but solution-wise, we're not, you know, if, if everybody's envisioning six, there could be four. You could have a quadplex rather than a duplex, mm -hmm. which, uh, and you still could achieve some residential character to that. So it's not it, necessarily, and that that's why I would opt for a special use subject to approval to see what the design solution is. Yeah, and that, I, I guess just jump to assuming it's a, a six unit town, a row house. Correct so, me if I'm wrong, but I'm hearing consensus on the special use end of it. I, I haven't heard consensus on the boundaries of the district, though, if it should just be west of. Yeah, I would be inclined to uh, keep it as, it, as, as, it. as we've discussed it, east of 5th. I'm unfortunately not as familiar with west of 5th and north of Payton. What, what that would. Keep it, you mean east of 5th would be just the what it is right now correct okay well what it is right now allows for the two family three family Understood. so um so i guess then there wouldn't really be a difference because all all of this area whoop, excuse me i guess that i thought the question was should east of fifth be single family and not allow for the two and three family units and then have this more of the mixed density residential area west of fifth I thought the two and three family would be allowed. I assume that would be permitted as, as is, assuming it is residentially scaled. So it would be an R5 and like an R5A then or something like that if you're well, subdividing it, 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 that's that what I'm saying zoning? Is I, I didn't see a, a zoning that would, that would speak to that specifically. I guess it, it's the proposed mixed density residential district that would allow for the two and three family and single family and then a special use for anything more than three units. Okay. That's fine. Okay. So it's n it's not really any of these un proposed zoning areas. It wouldn't be any of the proposed ones, though, as they stand right now. Um, I guess I'm not. I'm not. I want to make sure I'm understanding the question. Is the question is there a district that allows for one, two, and three family, and then would not allow for six anything more than that even by special use or or by special use what what is that one what i is think that? i think that's we would just change uh this. mixed use high density to be that right change it okay. to be a special use in all cases throughout the district so it's not a right it's a special use that right so sense. whether it's east or west of fifth street it would always be a special use Sounds right to me. So we're protecting the character as is, and, right. and keeping the door open for special use, right. depending on what it looks like and what the circumstances are. Okay. Do we have consensus on that? Do you think? So it would stay the mixed, high density residential which allows for two or three families but anything beyond that would require special use permit correct right and would require more scrutiny from zoning and from right. likely some assemblage of properties and, and it would also require review by this commission for those buildings to right, make yeah. sure they, they're compatible with the neighborhood scale and and an architectural character The alternative of, of which I guess the commission could just reject this outright, right? And a recommendation would be to return it to R3, just the, the yellow. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I would almost think that, but, but the problem with R3 is it doesn't allow two and three right. yeah. at all. It's currently R6, so uh -huh. you would be, you can't, you would be making things that are existing non-conforming. Non That's what I'm saying. So there's it's, no alternative. It's okay to make things non conforming if the desire is to see change long term. Yeah. And that's that's how you get there. Is eventually when they go away <laughs> you'll you'll get 
the single family home or, or whatever it is you aim to see in the area. Um, so I guess that's the, the, the question is the desire to see either all or part of this area only be single family. If the desire is you know, to see the mixed use west of 5th Street, then we could draw the line there for the mixed density and say... With special say, use only. With special use only, and then say single family east of 5th Street, making some properties not conforming, um, knowing they'll be grandfathered in. But I guess, can I ask the question the opposite way? Was the master plan, the intent of the master plan, to put this much more density into the downtown the downtown area? The land use plan showed all of this area as single family. So that's, that's kind of where we started with the, uh, the recommendation of the working group was, well, if we're trying to achieve density and preserve mm -hmm. affordable housing or even create affordable housing, we should look to keep those that we do have. Um, and that's why they, they recommended keeping this mixed density. Um, I don't believe it does. Um, that, that was an opportunity site. There was a mixed use development that would allow dwellings above the ground floor. Um, all of our residential, dis or, sorry, excuse me, commercial districts allow for dwelling units above the ground floor. Okay. What I'm hearing from the commission and the discussion, just sitting here listening, is that, and this is a question I just asked David a few minutes ago, the, the goal of the master uh, station master stationary master plan is to increase density, but that density, what what the maximum density should be, has never been defined. Mm -hmm. I think that's what you're all struggling with is trying to put a definition on that, and and maybe that hasn't been addressed in all the other discussions yet. Is what what is the maximum density that the downtown area can have before it starts uh, changing its character? So I think whatever you land on. I think that's the question you're trying to grapple with to give some response back to yeah. uh, David and the and the rest of yeah. the I think we've learned process. since 2013 we've learned what we're not comfortable with you know we had proposals for five-story apartment buildings um, that level of the those big swings we were not comfortable with we've saw you know 100 units added over that time but in incremental smaller developments townhomes 20 apartments here um, two apartments above retail Mm -hmm. um, those kind of changes. So if we're adding density within, within the scale and character of our historic district, how, how are we achieving that? Where, where are the opportunities? Well, I, 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 yeah, I think, that, I think that, that what I'm hearing from the commission is the density, the two and three family density is what we're looking for, not the six not the six row units, or six unit row houses that would change the character. So if someone wants to have a coach house in the back of their property, they could, if they had enough land, they could build that and, and rent it out as a second family unit. Is that what, is that the character you, we're kind of landing on and then if if there were a special it would require a special use to do anything beyond that but it would be allowed so that if something were to happen on you know sixth street that they were able to do it it could happen yeah. but it would give us more oversight of what happens right than just by right right yeah, yeah ideally i would just i would just say this is have, have it all just single family but if you can have residentially scaled that permits two and three so the main structure could have two units and the coach house could have a third as long as it looks like a single family i couldn't object to that it's the row house appearance yeah. that does change the character and that's the way we get more density within the uh, downtown if you will and i, I 
slightly, slightly more because I mean you're really just eliminating a six foot side yard setback between units. So you're not in areas where you might be removing three, you might get four, maybe five townhomes in that area. Um, so I guess again, I'm hearing consensus that if we're going to allow townhomes, it don't, should only be by special use. But I haven't, I guess, I haven't clearly gotten direction on if this is the area that should be considered that mixed density district, or if it's part single family and and part mixed density. West of Fifth. What what's your what's the commission's feeling on that? <laughs> I could I could see west of fifth because it seems like that's kind of where it goes. Logical dividing line. Yeah. Okay. We have a do you have another comment? Blue lines that weren't. I don't think. I don't think they're um, multifamily. Um, you know, so I don't. Um, are they? Are they west of fifth by any chance? <laughs> uh, yeah, they're between fifth and sixth. Okay. Um, the one that's surrounded by orange um, on fifth. Uh, see that one's marked, and I think that's single family. Somebody um, just bought it, put in a brand new fence. Um, and it, it looks like there's just a uh, single family use on that one. Um, and then the Cape Cod that's on the corner of Peyton and Fifth, um, I don't see, it, I think the whole house is just a rental, but I think it's just one person renting it. It's two is, is it? That one is two, but you're right on the other house. Yeah. On Fifth Street, uh, mm -hmm. the couple that Okay, and then the one on Ford and Sixth, that one's not even, you know, it was multifamily, it's abandoned and, you know, de deteriorating before everyone's eyes. Nobody's mm -hmm. doing anything uh, with it, so it's not even lived in. Um, so, and then the other, you know, you know, the, the logical spot for allowing the row homes and that would be uh, long six backing up to the factory um, as a buffer zone and you know the other area you know I could see on um, Stevens you know because again it's another factory zone where you know half the block of um, Stevens sixth fifth or something that would be um, a section you know maybe you consider but you know, I don't know why um, you're not looking at the, you know, recommendations of the master plan uh, to turn this back to R3. I mean, is there? A well, well, I think, reason? I think, I think, and Mr. Groot, Groot, I think that the reason is, is that there's, there's a, quite a few non We don't want to, we don't want to limit the non-conforming people to not be able to do what they do now. Right, well they can be a legally, you know, grandfathered in, non-conforming until such time they, they sold stop it or changed, you know, change. changed use or whatever, just like you're doing with the uh, other sections of the zoning. Um, I, 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 under, I understand that, but I, I think we're trying to kind of meet in the middle of, of not saying, because I, I, I think what I'm hearing from the commission is, is that two and three, two and three family homes, like a coach house and a, and a main house, don't change the character of the area. And, and we- well, No, not, but, not so much. No, it doesn't. Not, I, I mean, it, it, it just doesn't, it, it keeps it in the residential scale. And I think that's what the commission is more concerned about. Yeah, definitely. Um, and so th that's, that's kind of, and I'm speaking for the commission, do you, do you agree? So. Well, there's also equally a number of homes that fit that same criteria that's in the yellow R3 
now you know the same so how are they different than I, the rest so that's my there, only point is i i understand that i understand that i mean so one's treated you know differently than um the rest and you know that uh it's only going to turn back to more single family use you know as time goes on i think it's the direction it's going um and then I think I'd ask you. Um, if I may, uh, that that that's an opinion. But why, if we're trying to increase density, what 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 what's what what's the facts behind that comment? Why why? Uh, well, I hear the the city is trying to increase density, and 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 your position is no, we're going the other way. They're, they're no, reverting I mean, just back in, to single family. The market. I, I don't understand uh, that. The market is kind of demand, demanding more single family in town is, houses. Is that to buy. correct from the city's perspective? I, I thought we're. I think we're seeing to, a mix of it in, in the historic district. We see some areas with a demand for increasing the density to, to multi-family townhomes, but we also are seeing some of the homes converting back to single family. So I think it depends as much on the uh, on the people looking at the property as what the the general market is well I, I would think then then what we're proposing in zoning would be reflective of what the market trend in in the the short term and and midterm future would be uh, because uh, we're, we're looking at proposals to increase density and if we're hearing we're going the other way. Uh, some of this is almost a moot point, isn't it? I, I don't disagree. Um, well, the density. I mean, um, east of thirty-one. I mean, that's where you get your bigger density. You know, all your projects along the river there. Um, the section six street towards the Burgess factory. You know, have your higher density there. I mean, Park Place was an ex excellent example of um, getting in your higher density without changing anybody's, you know, character. Um, it's surrounded by, you know, the, you know, cemetery, the park, Route 31. Mm -hmm. That was a very nice addition to the neighborhood um, to just even have the risk that you can, you know, really nilly have a six unit townhome or four unit townhome even you know, pop in amongst the residential neighborhood here is a little bit concerning. They kind of need to be grouped together so that they look proper, you know, like the Muse. You know, they took up a whole city block. I think there's nothing really wrong with the scale there at all. It's it's on a busy street, you know. So it's it's all those areas with the busy street, the factory, you know, they are a nice spot for those types of dwellings um, so and then you know the other thing I wanted to point out was you know all along third street you don't have another buffer zone of you know multifamily it goes right from your residentially scaled commercial right into R3 mm -hmm. we don't need this double border buffer zone you know for you know, and we're trying to maintain the uh, historic homes in the north district you know there's more and more that are you know coming down um so to allow a developer to potentially gather up enough lots you know to do something with you know they're going to find a way you know so yeah. and you might as well manage them to the where areas they're going to do the least amount of <laughs> neighborhood damage so Okay. And is there a way to maybe make a if, you, if it's not going to pass or you know you're going to go that way um, where you know the multifamilies are owner occupied you know that might be something that helps with the you know pride of ownership and and all that mm -hmm. that it's you know okay but, all right thanks thank you, thank you. I've got a couple questions uh, David, yeah, you know, using your map here, what is uh, could could you just define for me again? What does mixed mean on this proposed? Um... Mixed means it would allow for 
one family, two family, three family, and as the commission would the desire would allow for the six unit up to six units by a special use permit. And what is the dotted uh, yellow? The dotted yellow is a high density single family. How does that differ? Um, smaller uh, lot sizes, uh, single family uh, only doesn't allow for two family, three family. Okay. That's primarily along Anderson Boulevard, and then I think we have a few um, down by <coughs> the train station on South Street. And then the solid yellow is just just single the medium only. density single family, right? Um, forgive me I, I don't mean to sound redundant but I I think what I'm hearing is there may be instances where townhomes are appropriate um, whether it's west of 5th Street or uh, by Wheeler Park whatever so allowing them by special use gives you that um, extra layer where they're not going in uh, willy-nilly or, or whatever term we want to use they're not going in by right without some scrutiny um, I, I don't think anybody can say that the Campbell Row project went in without some serious scrutiny um, and depending on who you ask I've heard a lot of compliments about that development since it's been put up I've heard others you know still aren't happy with it um, so I, I think I've heard that the special use tool may be appropriate, but again, kind of defining the boundaries of, of that district. If, if it's special use, if it's going to be special use, it really doesn't matter whether it's uh, um, your mixed high density or your single family. I mean, it still would be a special use that would be allowed in either case, right? It, it would not be allowed in the single family. So I guess that's the question. If you were to what say special right. east of 5th Street should be a single family zoning district, right. it wouldn't allow for two family, it wouldn't allow for three family, and it wouldn't allow for the townhomes by special use. And and the ones that are there now would be grandfathered in it, until right. legally non conforming. Right. So the use can continue indefinitely. Once it's converted back to single family, then it can't go back to a duplex. But if someone were to sell that property and keep it as a rental property a, a two family it would stay as two family correct I, w I would I would tend to think that that anything it, it, it's where you draw the line of east of is it east of 5th Street is it east of 6th Street I I think that would be that's the way I would look at it but I I could be you know, if the consensus is that it should be multi-family two, two and three, everywhere where it is R six right now, I don't know whether I, I could be convinced either way. But I, I do see the benefit of making it single family up to that, up to the orange. Orange. What's everyone's opinion? Of well, my, my only concern <coughs> is that the, uh, uh, there's been a, a lot of effort that's gone into this plan and study, and, and I don't have the expertise or the background knowledge to say, I, I'd like to know, you know, the basis more than, you know, we're looking at a colored map and, and, and some sketch, uh, some identification of what potentially are two in three-story residential properties, and that's the basis for where we draw the line. Yeah, and and I, I, I would say I, I really don't have enough information then to to make that distinction, other than to say that that since it's already uh, proposed to be uh, multi-residential, I, I I could. I could go with two or three and then with special use above that in these particular areas. But that's about all I'm prepared to to really attest to at this point in time. Is it, do you agree with that, Al? Well, I, I mean, so you're saying that the mixed high density actually came about because it's already has the two, it, it's already 
as the two or three families living in there, and that's why it seemed reasonable to include it that way? Or? I mean, that, that, that was part of it. Um, yeah, when you look at a kind of a clean slate, typical urban transect, right, you have a commercial core surrounded by multifamily, then you kind of step it down to townhomes, and then you get into your single family neighborhoods. Geneva is unique that we don't have that typical transect. We have a commercial core surrounded by single family homes that have been converted to co commercial structures, surrounded by more single family homes. So adding density is, is difficult, and we've, we've wound up doing it kind of on the periphery of the downtown rather than at the core of the downtown. Um, so in these areas where we have these, these two and three family structures, we looked at that as a potential opportunity to, first of all, preserve those, allow for more conversions to duplexes, um, but then also if somebody is able to assemble properties, consider uh, higher density townhome units in those areas. Yeah, see, and I wouldn't want to. You wouldn't want to allow that. I wouldn't want to see that. Yeah, it, I, 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 that's that's the consensus I'm getting from the historic that that it's the the only reason I don't like special use is because it it really dovetails into the bulk aspects of it and how. Because if it were a special use and I could get the Muse, I'd be fine. But if I get something on South Seventh and Cam or Campbell and um, Fourth, I wouldn't. I'm, I'm not as the, the difference in bulk on those two examples are, are what I'm having a problem with. Well, I think that's I think that's part of the next discussion. So we, okay. if if we're okay. Are with, we, allow, with allowing them by special use, then we can start talking about what those bulk regulations look like. Can I ask one more question? If I'm a homeowner in the yellow area or the R3 area, could I have my property divided into two or three families in any way? You cannot. No special use? Right. You'd have to go back and get it rezoned correctly? Right. Which is what happened for the Campbell Street project, right? I'm assuming that was rezoned then, or was that? That was actually zoned commercial, and then it had to be rezoned to multifamily to allow that to happen. So uh, there were multiple requests with that, but one of them was also the special use planning and development process. Okay, well, do we have a consensus then on the special use? I guess that's that's the sticking point on it. So that seems to be a, a compromise okay. between our our three, you know, single family and identity. Yeah. But does anyone want to change it to single family yellow, if you will? I was going to lean that way if there was an opportunity to do a special use for the two and three family. Okay. Because I, I mean, uh, frankly, there are some homes that I looking at this that are multifamily now, and you know my neighbor across the street. I don't know why they would not be able to do that if if that is what they wanted. I mean, it would maintain the character. Yeah. I'm not talking about tearing it down. It's back to your putting a room over the garage and yeah and renting it out commissioner hamilton so if i'm hearing what you're saying you would be actually more comfortable if everything north of uh, um of the of of the orange of the orange was actually a zoning category that allowed for up to three family uses as long as they maintained a single family architectural appearance yes would, which would which would yield density but, but I, I guess it would take out this it would take out the six unit townhomes completely of what I'm hearing as I just want to make sure that's what I was hearing so you're comfortable with that and not allowing the townhomes even by special use permit I wouldn't okay. 
I think that the challenge we have is um, you know, creating flexible zoning districts where you have, you have the ability to do maybe more than one thing. Um, we don't have a townhome specific zoning district. And I can't think of areas where that really would be appropriate. Um, so, you know, suggesting that it's allowed by, by right or by special use permit is in no way saying this entire area should become townhomes. Um, but it's providing, uh, I guess, an opportunity to consider a request um, if somebody is able to assemble property and it's in an inappropriate location and an appropriate scale. Um, I, I guess in my view, that goes contrary to the character of the area. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I think that's where we're... I, I think we, you know, the periphery, as one, one lady said, uh, you know, keeping it off in, in the periphery of the, of the district sort of helps us maintain that central character, that central core. But as soon as you're plopping them right in the center, it starts to become... It's a concern. There it is. You know, it's sort of, so how do we keep it away from the center? Sounds like the consensus is to not permit density there. Even by special use, at that, even within the core, it wouldn't be within special use, right? I'm sorry, say that again. Even, even within the, the main port, of, you'd allow the two and three family, but you wouldn't allow the, the, the townhome. If, are we talking about the mixed high density residential? Yes. Yes. What about west of Sixth Street? <laughs> and I don't mean. I mean do, do we draw a line at that point? Well, I think this gets into what Commissioner Hiller said about the periphery. Um, yeah, I I could see west of Sixth being the periphery. It's right up by the industry, right up by the Burgess Norton. It's. Mm -hmm. What is what does the rest of the commission think about that? West of Sixth Street. No, there yeah. isn't. <laughs> I remember that they already approved town homes on Payton and uh, adjacent to Burgess. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, right off the map. Yeah. Right off. Yeah. It's west of Six. To make it so anything west of six would be special use then <laughs> I guess that's the question or would just be multi the, the standard tan if you will or, or do we just leave it I, um, we have to kind of get off this portion of it. Yep. So let yep. let's make a quick, or let's make a decision. I, about I would I would I would leave west of six tan and take the rest of what's tan to it, to yellow. To yellow. If 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 we could, I don't know if it's possible to do a special use for the two and three families, but I would I would not do anything. No townhomes, condominium. Yeah. Does everyone agree with that? It's my... No. No? At what if 4th Street School ever came... I don't mean to go off on that tangent, but to sell it, but if you put that, that is a possibility of taking a older structure, historic structure, and turning it into so, I mean, I'm just saying you need to be careful with the work. I mean, I'm just That's a separate zoning district in itself, to tell you the truth. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. No, it, it, it's, it's, a, good it, that's, question, it's a good question, but it is a separate zoning district oh, in itself. Thank you. It is a very... Um, well, I, I don't... 
Go ahead. My concern is just the the, the central core. I mean, I, I would say even west of fifth, but uh, only because I, I I think it's a it would be an extraordinary situation if somebody were able to buy up that much property to put yeah. this up anyway. I mean, it's an it's unlikely situation, but um, I, I I'd be more inclined to. Uh, I'd be more upset to see that right in the in the central core of the, the district. But that, that's. Mm -hmm. So, I'm afraid we don't have a consensus. <laughs> um, it's going to be a special use, no matter what. I mean, I. I yeah. I just I just don't like the idea of having it as uh, an option to get to a special use because I feel like we get things like and not that I shouldn't use examples but I'm afraid of things that happen they go through the process and it doesn't get as much looked at as it should so I mean if if the commission we can't reach consensus. I think we can, I mean, summarize the opinions that have been expressed. Okay. And those can be forwarded to the Planning Commission, uh, which will also make a recommendation on this issue. Um, I, I think I've heard a lot of a lot of valid points, and I think that's that's the complexity of trying to balance all these different goals and objectives of, of a master plan where you're trying to preserve your character but also accommodate new infill and increased density without destroying that character it is it's definitely a balancing act and it, it is it is hard to do based on existing conditions um, existing development patterns and kind of a um, an atypical downtown uh, development pattern do you have enough information <laughs> I, I think I do okay let's move on to are we on the uh, do we have another district to look we, at we've got a few different areas I guess well, I guess while we're on the topic of townhomes, going back to, um, you know, the bulk regulations, um, we heard some comments tonight about, you know, well, the Muse is okay. That, that fits in, scale, setback, um, but maybe other products don't. So is the maximum building height of 40 feet too tall? Um, is should we aim for something lower at a maximum of 38 should we keep it at 35 and force the issue you know try to get it below 35 and if you if you can't then you have to seek zoning relief I would like I mean I don't, I don't know do you, you don't happen to know the height of the muse do you I don't I don't I think we researched that when the other ones were going up and we didn't have accurate records okay um but i would i would guess they're probably in that 35 foot range yeah. i'd rather yep. i'd rather see them try to sink the and keep it a story and a half or a half story down on the parking side so so that it, they don't get as tall okay. does everyone agree Keep it to 35. Keep yeah. it to 35. I, I think I think keeping it to 35 makes the uh, makes them come up with a solution that uh, might fits better with the. I guess the question is though. Is, is that there a trade-off between encouraging the developer to be rear loading as the townhouses that are front loaded? I, I, encouraging uh, rear loading as opposed to front loading as a balance. 
Mr. Chairman. Um, I'm, I'm certainly willing to relinquish the microphone at any time for public okay. comment, but we do need public to address at the microphone okay. for the sake of the public record. Okay. Um, and, and he is correct that that was uh, part of the arguments that have been made for increased height is when you're doing a rear loaded unit um, and putting two floors above the garage instead of having a garage and then Correct. working off the side of it, you do need additional building height. Um, one of the other incentives was to reduce that required front yard setback so you have more room uh, for the more driveway. More spillable area, basically. Well, uh, so you can accommodate the, the driveway and the turning radius you need in the in back, the back. Okay. To, to have a rear loaded unit. So there were those kind of two incentives uh, to encourage it to be a rear loaded unit. I guess you could still keep the one um, reducing the setback. Uh, yeah, the, reducing the setback I could see, but I don't like increasing the height. Because that's, does this, okay. And I, I, I think by reducing, I think that's enough of an incentive. I would agree. Does, is that a consensus? Do we have a consensus on that? Well, what is, the, what is if, if it's not 35, what is being proposed for a height? 40 feet. The, well, the, the maximum height now in, in our districts are 35 feet in all our residential right. districts. Um, what we've seen with these rear loaded townhomes is requests for 38, 39. Um, we've had two, I think, come in at the at the 35 runder. One of them benefited from a North First Street. You know, they've got the slope going down to the river, and then they've got the rooftop decks. So they only had two stories, really, uh, from the street front. But otherwise, we're seeing kind of that, that 38 foot range. So 35 precludes three stories. Then. Well, it, not necessarily. I mean, it, it could be done with the sunken first yeah, floor. If you go down, but on grade starting on grade level or somewhere near there yeah uh, structure you might yeah. still be able to do it with a flat roof too it depends right okay. yeah or well, build and, into and the eaves you know which is is kind of like the 20 foot bonus that you get when you cut it off at 20 feet for the second floor for that that encourages a story and a half versus two-story houses right and keeping the scale down. And that's, I think, by limiting it to 35, we're trying to keep the scale down of those. Well, how, how is 35 established? That I, I'm relatively new here. How long is 35 men the established height for this uh, zoning? Since at least 1995. Okay. Um, I'd have to go back to the prior zoning ordinances to see if it was the same. But it's it's a pretty standard maximum residential building height. Okay. Um, okay. David, can you describe where 35 is measured from? Just so it's, it's grade or first floor, so that they are. It's the average that. grade around the property to the the peak uh, ridge line. Okay. The, the front yard grade. The average grade around the entire building. Around the whole entire building. Right. Okay. Yeah, that that makes three stories. From grade up, a little, little difficult. But you know, I guess that's my point. Well, that, I don't. Mean well, that, that that's where I, I. You know, is is 38 that much different than 35? If we're trying to say that we don't want that density of three stories, I can understand it. But but to say 35 when. 38 may achieve those goals, uh, then I question it. And apparently most of them have been modified or approved at higher anyway. So 37, 38 now. The ones right. That are yeah. I don't, I don't know about the majority, but again, in the ones in the historic district, um, 
I, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, Campbell Row was able to adjust it to get to be in compliance, right, with our. Right. I don't. Our, I don't think Campbell Row did need. I think they met the 35 foot. Correct. So in the historic district, the two townhomes we've looked at in the last four or five years, the uh, Campbell Row was under. And some of you are still saying you thought it's not quite in the character of the neighborhood. And then the other one that uh, required relief was uh, 7th Street. Um, I think they went a foot or two higher than what was allowed there. I think 7th Street was the highest that we've allowed, which was 39 and a half. Um, and that's for, I think, that northernmost unit that kind of spikes up. Just to give um, you an idea of. And just for reference, too, single family homes are allowed to go up to 35 feet. Uh, so I don't think going lower than that. Uh, for a townhome would be appropriate. Mm -hmm. So 35 is reasonable then. They were able to do it, keep that scale. It's close. Okay. So what a 35, but relief on the front yard uh, if, if you go to a rear load, uh, a rear load uh, garage, so you get 10 additional square, 10 feet across the front of the setback. setback. But does that conflict with the setback that's, that would have to be maintained from the existing structures that are there right now? I mean, not not right. there right now, but the, the adjacent structures. So you don't have that in the um, in the mixed density district. You only have that in the single family districts, and that's oh. that's the same as it is today. You don't have that requirement. You have that in the just in the single family single districts. Family districts. So that that wouldn't be a requirement. I don't mean to belabor this, but if, if you're concerned about height and street presence and character moving the front yard, reducing the front yard setback has a much greater impact on, on uh, the relative height from a visual perspective than it would be 38 with 20 is probably better than 35 at 10 from a street presence because you're looking at the visual character of these elevations. So to say one and then Well I think yeah. I think I think the I think you can I think by moving the setback forward you can increase the size of the property. <laughs> you know you can and that and getting the and that is the carrot to make you go to the back to the rear load garages. Right. But it may not, it might not actually, that it depends on the lot really more than anything else, correct? It depends on the lot. Um, it depends on, I guess, what, what we're weighing as more important. Um, our zoning ordinance has uh, strong incentives to not have garage doors. Facing uh, the street. Not only that, but being a kind of the prominent feature of, mm -hmm. of either a single family home or a duplex or a town home. Uh, so we have incentives laced throughout the ordinance, whether it's lot coverage bonuses for area bonuses to get those in the rear yard or get them side loaded. Um, if that's more important than allowing a little bit of additional building height, um, or if or they're equally important and and we provide an incentive to get it by reducing the setback to, to allow the garage in the back and keeping the building height at, at 35 feet. Good with that. I mean, I think if you're gonna do a rear loading garage, you're almost gonna need the, the, ten foot. the, the setback <laughs> yeah. to be reduced in order to have the space right. to get around. And I think with going with the 35 feet will solve part of what you said. If you're pulling it forward, it won't be as it won't feel as large with the reduced height. Do 
Do we have what you're feeling? What you're feeling on the side of is it 35 and it reduce the setback or 35 and leave the setback where it? It's a question of trade-offs, right? Um, I think the 10-foot setback is a good incentive for the rear loading, and I'd like to see it stay at 35. But, mm -hmm. okay. but going to 10-foot setback and up to 40 feet, it seems a little prominent. Right. But giving some incentive to move the garage doors off is where I'd fall. Is that seems stay with thirty five? Yes. All right, so we can move on to the next one. I promise they get a little bit easier as we go along. Um, next area for review. Oh, we did this one already. A second to get back in place. Okay, so the next areas were um, areas where the proposed zoning is consistent with the recommendations of the downtown master plan, but through the community workshops and discussions with property owners, uh, there were some concerns raised, um, and we wanted to make sure we bring those uh, to the commission's attention and ask for their uh, their recommendations. Looks like Mr. Mr. Krill left, um, but um, we'll relay the recommendation. Uh, to him so this is 18 south 5th street um, you have right behind the, the old pure oil building um, and then across the street from uh, state bank of geneva the existing zoning is the the b2 district um, b2 district allows for 100 percent lot coverage zero setbacks 45 feet of building height um, your core state street commercial district um, the proposed zoning for for these two properties, uh, 18 South 5th and the State Bank of Geneva, is that residentially scaled commercial mixed use. Um, and then that's what the downtown master plan calls for. Um, but in discussions with uh, Mr. Krill, who owns 18 South 5th, um, he raised a lot of concerns with what that change would mean because the B2 district is currently so flexible. Um, he was concerned that he wants to replace the garage in the back. He might lose parking. Um, he's where he wouldn't conform with the with the proposed regulations. Um, so he provided me with a plan of survey, and we were able to confirm that under the proposed district, he would comply with the lot area, lot width, lot coverage, and the principal building setback requirements. Um, so he would not become non-conforming in that way. Um, but he does have some existing non-conforming setbacks for the parking area and for the detached garage. And um, they're non-conforming today, and under the proposed district, they would also remain non-conforming. Um, but he still expressed some concern um, because he feels that he's not the beginning of the transitional area um, because he's in such close proximity. This picture on the right, you can really see the parking lot behind the um, St. Charles Bank um, is is really right on the property line, as are the parking lights, uh, parking lot lights. And then across the street, he also has another drive-through bank um, that really, this kind of faces his front yard. Um, so he felt that given the intensity of uses around him and that he faces Fifth Street, um, his property was not a logical beginning to the transitional area. If you go back to the map, the rest of these properties in the residentially scaled district, these all face James Street, um, where his property here faces faces Fifth Street. <coughs> and you've got the two drive-through banks on either side of him. Um, so, I, I think I've hope I've accurately summarized his concerns, and he is requesting to uh, keep the flexibility and be in the downtown commercial mixed-use district, which is kind of mirrors the, the existing B2 zoning district. Um, the State Bank of Geneva has not reached out to us and, and commented on their property, um, but given the discussion with Mr. Krill, uh, we thought we'd highlight this for the commission as well. 
We do have a drive through bank here. Um, some existing photos. This is the drive through. You can see the, the bank building in the, on the other side of the block in the background. Um, the bank, I lost that slide, it looks like. Oh, there we go. Uh, so the bank would comply with the minimum lot and width area requirements, but the existing improvements on the site otherwise don't comply with setbacks. Um, the parking areas don't meet the setback requirements, and as a whole, uh, the properties would exceed the lot coverage restriction proposed for the residentially scaled uh, zoning district. So I guess the, the question for the commission uh, this evening, I guess is twofold, is do we see 18th South 5th Street as the beginning of a transitional zoning district? Um, because it, it really is uh, an old home that was converted into a commercial use. Um, although it doesn't face Dream Street like, the, like the, the rest of the properties, it does have the front lawn and significant setbacks. Um, and then do we see the State Bank of Geneva um, should that ever redevelop? Should that be at a residentially scaled commercial district or should that be of a similar intensity where we have high lot coverage, uh, minimal setbacks, if any, and up to 45 feet in building height? And again, I, I can pull up Google Earth and we can move around and do, do whatever we need to do. So the, the hatching means that that area is, the green hatching is to be go to red, basically? All right, I was just trying to highlight the properties yeah. in question yeah, there. Those, yeah, those are the two. Yeah, the question is, um, yeah, should they, should they stay in the residentially scaled commercial district or should they go to the higher intensity? Red. I... Uh, I mean, it's it's already existing as a the Geneva State Bank is probably easier an easier one to discuss first. Would would that be an issue of going to the red zoning, if you will, where there's zero lot line and different park? What what's the the parking? Would it be conforming if it were the red right now? Um, yes, it would. Okay. Uh, it, some of the parking is, is right on the property line, so, so yeah. maybe not um, completely, but for the most part it would be. But I think the bigger question besides the existing conformity or, or nonconformity is long term. You know, if the, if the bank were ever to go yeah. away and this half of the block were to redevelop, you've got um, more residentially scaled development on the south side of James Street. Um, there's the area we talked about earlier with some duplexes and single family homes. And then you've got the Child Advocacy Center um, on the other side of the courthouse building here. Um, so you've got some smaller structures, you know, kind of transitioning into the residential neighborhood. Um, I guess if you go, if you go west though, or I'm sorry, east, you can see that whole block is is red, is right. of a right. higher intensity, and it's that way all the way to the river. Basically, yeah. Right. So that state bank is that's the orange, the back half of that block between fourth and fifth. Yeah. Right. Right. That. Yes. And if that were to go away, we'd prefer that to be a, a more of a residential, or even that would be a possible townhouse location. The the other lot uh, wasn't always the first one in though. We had a lot of demolition of a house right behind Pure Oil when they were putting that bank in there. So right. it was definitely a part of the transition into the, into the residential. And I think it, it, allowing that to be, um, you know, the B2 or the, the new uh, DCM would, would allow that one to go on to eventually build out to the maximum of the lot you'd lose that character, that the potential character there. So I, I would you'd be just, just see that one stay as it is. Now, he would like to change that to the B2 or the DC. Yeah. Right, he'd like to preserve 
but he doesn't want it. that would that wouldn't preserve the building that would allow him more flexibility to, in the future to, to change right. it or, right. right so it would go to red right is that, that the ask that's his request correct but it still wouldn't allow him to tear down the building unless it was <laughs> he'd still have to go through the process to tear down the building though. unless I mean, it that, was approved by the HPC or yeah. City Council right but I think the question is more about the long-term intent yeah yeah I, And, and the advantage to him to have that go to commercial mixed use is, is what? I, I think from his perspective, it's just uh, maintaining the flexibility he has today under the B2 zoning district um, in terms of setbacks and lot coverage. Um, I guess when the B2J transitional district was established, I, I think it was 12 years ago maybe, there was a lot of discussion about his property then and where the boundary of that transitional district should be drawn and at that time it was it was drawn around at the heavy black line where you see it's today <laughs> um so I, I wasn't here for that history and i don't know if any of you were um but i think what the recommendation of the downtown plan was just kind of the visual break be, between the state street frontage and then when you have the residentially scaled commercial buildings begin if I think about that that property it's very similar to the residentially scaled businesses that are also on that north side that are what are in in the proposed orange you know up and down James Street or over on Hamilton Street it, it's very similar in character right so it fits today in my mind with the orange well, I agree I mean I think but, that but the flexibility of uh, he, he doesn't have flexibility to tear down the building to begin with right I mean because he would have to come in front of the HPC and, and the City Council to get a demolition permit for that so we would have to go through a process to begin with um, but I, I, I agree it, it's just whether he could redevelop or keep the flexibility of that at that point and I'm, I'm not sure it's redevelopment or whether it's just yeah, I mean we've discussed some of the trade-offs um, with him you know by staying in the in the red district um, you're required to have either office or uh, commercial on, on the first floor and you can have dwelling units above in the orange district you have more flexibility in the uses where you could have you can convert it back to single family you can have it be a two flat or you can keep it as a mixed-use building with office and, and residential above so there's a little more flexibility in the orange from a use perspective but not as much on the bulk standards not as much on the what the bulk standard setback slot coverage building height you get more flexibility in the in the DCM or the red district I guess though I'm not sure what the benefit to him is I mean what is he wanting to change some of those things or um, I, I, all I've been able to, to get, gather is that he he does have a garage that's kind of deteriorating in the back of the lot and he does want to uh, replace that and he's concerned that he might not be able to uh, kind of he doesn't know exactly what his plan is there yet and he's concerned that with the loss of flexibility he might not be able to do whatever it is he ultimately comes up with wouldn't the appraised value change based on the zoning result I think I'm, that I don't know I, I think they look at the existing improvements and uses more than they do the right zoning. but if you look at potential it, it's governed to some degree I would think there's some financial issues long term here one way or the other I don't have a position on it, but I would think. Right. Uh, and and uh, any uh, any change or modification, you always have the option to get the, going for a variance on the zoning anyway. That would be true. Yeah. Yeah. Are we leaning towards keeping it orange? I mean, that's I mean, it's the character it is right now, and I guess that 
That's yeah, kind of kind of should the bank disappear sometime, we're not going to end up with with a, a huge commercial four-story building in there. It'll have to be somewhat scale. It could it could be up. It could be a condo or a, a townhome or anything that definitely would be in scale. Because you're still you know you're right at the edge of the yeah. of the neighborhoods there, so we'd like to keep it at scale. What's okay. the? Do I like it as proposed. Mm -hmm. Orange. That's the consensus that I've gathered. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And then the the state bank is that the same there or? Again, kind of thinking long term. If that if that were to redevelop. That we wouldn't want it to get bigger, and we wouldn't any bigger than it is. So that if we don't change it, it would have to be revert back to something a little bit smaller. Right. It? Yeah. That's yes, good yeah. that. As shown. As shown? Yeah, I, I guess that would be the... All right, then we can move on to the next one. Um, I, I do promise I think they're getting slightly easier. Okay, this one, um, we're between James and Campbell along 3rd Street. We're on the, uh, the east side of 3rd Street. The existing zoning is B2, which again is that 100% lot coverage, no setbacks, uh, 45 feet in building height, um, kind of your state street zoning. Um, that's the existing zoning. Proposed zoning uh, was is residentially scaled commercial mixed use. That's consistent with what the downtown master plan shows as residentially scaled commercial. Um, and honestly, I'm not, I'm not sure why that recommendation was in the downtown master plan because when you look at the existing improvements, you definitely have that, that presence on the sidewalk, no <coughs> setbacks, 100% lot coverage. Um, some of the properties here would not comply with the minimum lot and area requirements of that residentially scaled district. None of them. None of the existing buildings uh, would comply with the setbacks and lot coverage requirements. Uh, the buildings on that block are Art Amnesia on the corner, uh, Geneva History Museum, and then the 127 building at the other corner. Um, so you could see they're, they're right on the sidewalk or even overhanging in the sidewalk um, and maximize the, the lot coverage and building setbacks. So uh, there was some concern raised by owners of, of properties along this frontage uh, not understanding why that why that change was being proposed, I think if the goal is to uh, to preserve these buildings and preserve that presence on the street, uh, the the red district would be in a more appropriate zoning district. The red would reflect more as is, but not as we might want. Right, and I guess that's that's the question: Do we want to keep what's there? Um, I believe the Artemisia building, we went through quite a bit yeah. to, to preserve that building and, yeah. and keep it on and that James. corner. Yeah. And then the History yeah. Museum, obviously a newer construction. Yeah. Um, do we want to maintain that character along that stretch of 3rd Street? Mm -hmm. And yeah. there was a house there that had been moved. Right, the bookstore, right? The bookstore, the bookstore right. moved around the corner, so right? You right. can see why that would have been, they, they would have wanted to keep the setback for that because that was keeping with the rest of the third street kind of character at the time. Um, right, but the, the, it, the it, master plan came after that move, so yeah. this might be an area where it, it just kind of fell through the cracks, if you will. Falling through the cracks, right? Yeah. What's the, what's the maximum height on the, on the red district? <laughs> um, so it's uh, 50 feet is the maximum height, which would allow for four stories or, yeah. Um, Again, subject to review by the Historic Preservation Commission mm -hmm. to make sure we're in keeping with the scale and character of the area. So I don't think uh, that's going to be an issue. I, I, it, I couldn't imagine five stories in between <laughs> two. But, no. All right. So the, the, the line between James and Campbell that, that bisects that block, is that if if the hatched area were to go to red would that include the bookstore or is that why 
it would include the bookstore, um, but not the Unitarian Church on the, on the corner of 2nd so, and James. And not the Patton House at all. And not the say. Patton House, right. Those are residentially scaled. I don't, I don't see an issue with it. Do you, does anyone see an issue with it? I mean, unless we would want the bookstore to stay in the orange. But that's, I don't know. Yeah. I think, Split the uh, hair, I guess. The bookstore uh, has a bit of a, a setback off of James Street, um, but there was a master plan, the parking lot that was put in a few years back. There was a master plan to continue that parking lot all the way through the middle of the block to James Street. Um, it stopped short because there was some uncertainty with property ownership and, and what was going to develop. Um, we're trying to see if there's any possibility of continuing that through, and that would kind of maximize their lot coverage and setbacks. So keeping it red would give us flexibility to maybe one day okay. take that parking lot through the block. Mm -hmm. I support that. Uh, any issues with that? No. Okay. And years ago, we approved that. I think it was uh, yeah. movable feast was going to build in there, and they were going to put it right out to the sidewalk anyway. So that's right. Yeah. That no, it'll go to a red. Okay. On a roll. So this last area, the last areas for review are kind of staff recommendations that we've identified. Uh, kind of through this final round of review through the community workshops uh, where the proposed zoning is not consistent with the downtown stationary master plan and these are again maybe as the maps were being drawn and redrawn areas that perhaps fell through the cracks um, so i just because we've published these maps and they've been in the public eye i don't want to change anything behind the scenes i want to make sure it's all done out in the open um, the existing zoning we're between Fulton and South Street now, so this is uh, 404 and 426 South Third Little Traveler um, across from Dotson Place. Existing zoning is, uh, I'm sorry, that that's not correct. That should be the B3 Business District. Um, B3 Business District is what you see along most of this stretch in orange on Third Street where you've got the front yard setback converted uh, structures uh, converted residential structures to businesses the proposed zoning uh, downtown residentially scaled commercial mixed use but the downtown master plan uh, showed it as commercial mixed use so the downtown master plan showed the little traveler and the the building to the south as red which again allows for 100 percent lot coverage no setbacks uh, 50 feet of building height um, and when we look at that a little more closely, those properties would comply with the lot and area requirements. Um, but if if we, if we went to the residentially scale commercial mixed use, we would be able to preserve that front yard setback where we cannot do that in the uh, the red district, the TCM district. So we want to leave that where it is. Yeah, yeah I would. Right, because I mean this, this front lawn, um, the front lawn of both of those I think are part of the key character of South Third Street. Right. Um, and you look at the back of the buildings, they're a little tight on setbacks and some of the right. parking areas. Um, those are non-conformities today. Those would be non-conformities under the proposed district. Mm -hmm. But if we keep them in the residentially scaled commercial district, that front yard setback is frozen. Yep. So they mm -hmm. can't further encroach onto Third Street. No said. Okay. I would agree with that. That's that we we agree that it should go stay orange correct right. was it in, it was intended to be red in the master plan is that the idea right and okay. yeah one of those that might have just been oversight mirroring the dots in place across the street or something mm -hmm. i think this is the last one but this is uh, preservation bread and wine atlas chicken um, in the downtown plan, it was shown as commercial mixed use, which is the red. Again, zero setbacks, lot coverage, 100%. Uh, and in the proposed zoning, it got marked as residentially scaled commercial mixed use, which would require front yard setbacks and limit lot coverage. Um, if you look, yeah, if you look at existing conditions, it doesn't. We're at 100% on on everything. Um, and if you look at the surrounding uses. <laughs> 
you know, everything is kind of on the sidewalk, 100% yeah. lot coverage. Uh, so long term, we think it's our recommendation is to keep it in the DCM district. I would agree with that. Any issues? No. No. Nope. Okay. Okay. So that's that's the direct questions I had for the commission. I appreciate you taking time to walk through that with me. Um, our next steps would be a plan commission public hearing on March 28th where your recommendations will be forwarded uh, for their consideration. We'll go through uh, these same questions with the plan commission and get their, get their feedback um, as well as other areas outside the boundaries of the historic district and we'll f uh, finalize the, the draft and hopefully be able to forward that to the city council uh, mid-April. Again, I sincerely appreciate you making special time tonight and then taking uh, your time and being thoughtful with your responses. Uh, are there any questions that you had of me that were not answered in the presentation or any other areas you wish to discuss? I had one, um, only uh, because it kind of stood out and I wasn't sure if I was right. Maybe I just need a little clarification. In the uh, zoning downtown updates, uh, you define bed and breakfast as five rooms, uh, um, let me see I wrote my notes out here someplace. Um, uh, less guests, but you could uh, serve breakfast only, and it was allowed in single family, medium density. This was a bed and breakfast because you said you wanted to allow them more in the single area residential under a special use. I right. believe I saw it. Um, but then when you get, but I also read somewhere that uh, le restaurants weren't allowed, but then when you get to the definition of inn, the inn is 10 guests, but you're allowing breakfast, meals, and banquet areas. And that was a sp special use in a single family medium area also. So I, I, it, it kind of jumped out as you're allowing a restaurant and a banquet in a residential area with a special use. Did I read that correctly? Right, by, by a special use permit, um, bed and breakfast or inns would be permitted in, in single family districts. But again, they'd have to go through that public hearing process and demonstrate that they comply with the special use standards. But then somewhere else I read that you couldn't have a restaurant in the residential, the single family medium density right was well, a standalone no right but okay if but it's if it's an incorporated in into an in granted with a special use permit correct okay uh, something there just didn't ring right I, I wasn't sure exactly what i was but it, it sounded like we were allowing a restaurant in one but not the other um I think, I think that's coming out of a little bit of how the state statute is that defines bed and breakfast and inns right um it's not while inns can have public access, it's gen generally they're just designed to service a larger population than a bed and breakfast um, is allowed. So I think I think I think that's probably where that's coming from. Yeah, the the definitions for bed and breakfast and inn are driven by state statute, so that's what we followed there. Uh, we had a lot of discussion with where bed it, or Airbnbs fit into all of this. Um, so that's not the same thing. It's of a different character than a bed and breakfast or an inn. Because they were both uh, special use in the single family high density areas. Right. Medium density or high density? Either. High density? No, medium density. Medium density? <clears throat> it's a special use in either district. Right. It's a, it's a special use in a medium density, S SFMR, right? Right. That's okay. a medium the yellow. Residential. Yeah, the yellow. yellow. Family. Yeah, that, I could see bed and breakfast, but maybe not in. <laughs> I guess that was my point. Yeah, I, 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 I think that might be correct. <laughs> so keep those out of the single family districts? Well, the, I think the bed and breakfast could be in, but the inn could not be in. <laughs> so inn's out of the single family districts? The inn is out. <laughs> There might be a place for one, but it would be as hard to find one right. as it is right now. I mean, yeah. I, I, just, 
I, I guess if I was going to do a bed breakfast, I would just call it an inn and yeah. have more flexibility. <laughs> Except the state statute very clearly defines what a bed and breakfast is versus an inn. Yes, Inns don't have to be owner occupied, for instance. I, I um, bed and breakfast do. I think uh, in here they both had to be uh, op owner operated. Was this one? Yeah, they both have to be owner operated. Owner operated, owner -operated but not owner occupied. Not occupied. Bed and breakfast has to be owner occupied, has to have the owner on site. Inns do not. In is an operator occupied single family house. Check that. Yeah, we get we can double check that, but those those definitions should be lining up with the state definitions, so we can take a look at that. It says breakfast and other meals may be provided. Um, for guests and patrons in common in restaurant or banquet area. Bed and breakfast, operator occupied single family. Breakfast to uh, only. It's, it's, it's fine with the state statute here. The, the bed and breakfast is owner occupied and the owner has to reside on the site, but in the, the owner does not have to reside on the site. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Oh, I see. Yeah, down below you've got uh, the definition up here, and then bed and breakfast guest room, and then bed and breakfast operator is one of the other. Right. Or the operator is the owner of the bed and breakfast. Right. And you said the bed and breakfast would only be able to be located in the single family medium density residential, the yellow? By special use permit in the single family districts, um, permitted in the commercial districts. Commercial. Right, so if you were in the orange, like a, an old residence that's in a commercial district, that could become a bed and breakfast without going through the special use permit. But then the tan? Yeah, they're permitted in others, yeah. And the, so they're permitted the, in others. In well. the orange, I think. And yeah. the, in the primary re residential districts, they're special uses. And then in commercial districts, they're permitted uses. So the residentially scaled commercial use, it just get a permit to do it. Got it. Okay. okay. That, that answers it. Any other comments? The risk of being shot, um, are we close to having uh, consensus on the north I, I guess I, I I thought we were at one point and I don't mean to put you on the spot George but uh, if we had 30 seconds just for me to ask the question or reop sure. reopen that well in, in the or DN you, are you yeah, referring to in the okay. north yeah the north historic district I just want to understand as we go that you wanted to uh, be sensitive to and permit a special use of six family six yes. units Okay. In in the entire brown tan the area. Proposed tan yet area. Yeah. Rather than defining a specific, uh, okay. subdividing that parcel into, it seems like uh, that that's the. But I, I don't feel strong enough about it that, uh, you know, I, I would. Uh, 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 if there's a consensus to, but Sixth uh, Street. You have that one little half a block there. I, I wouldn't even bother with it. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I don't think that's realistic at all. <clears throat> you might as well just say you're not going to do it. Sure. And mm -hmm. for for that one little exception. So uh, but and, if we, and, we put uh, it to a vote, it would be right. basically go to R three. Well, and and you know the the, the uh, uh, a little aside. I've worked in Philadelphia, Baltimore. Washington DC with old row houses prior to built prior to 1900s so there are ways to do things and keep residential character I, I think everybody's looking at least from my perception in the context of what I've seen built around here they're all kind of stone very character wise very similar don't have a of wood on them and would not fit very well 
in some of these residential blocks. Uh, I'd be the first to agree, but I, I, I think it's incumbent on the, uh, the developer, the owner, and the architect to come up with something creative that would have that character, and that's why I'd consider a special use. So is that something that comes up in guidelines then later on? Well, I think it's it's part learning from those that we have considered yeah. and approved. I mean, before 2013, we didn't have much more than the Muse. <laughs> um, yeah. And we've, we've approved a few since then, and some characteristics we like and some we don't. And I think it's, it's a learning process and maybe, maybe design guideline updates for four townhomes in in these areas uh, would be appropriate. Do you agree? No? It's no. <laughs> Thank you, David. Thank okay. you. And, and lastly, I guess I feel in, in the peripheral downtown area, there is a place for row townhouses rather than just exclusively single-family residents. All right, I'm going to get the last word because I'm the chairman, <laughs> hopefully. I, I think you're correct, but I think if you look at the other, the south district, it comes from the yellow to the orange. And I think I think that's that's where I'm looking at it from. And I, I wish that two and three family were available to everyone with an R, with the yellow, personally. That would be the way to, to increase the density and not change the character. I think uh, something we have kind of touched on with the city council is looking at the possibility of uh, like ADUs, accessory dwelling units. Yes. Um, it's not part of this downtown zoning update, but I think something that we, we might have a policy discussion on in the, in the future. Mm -hmm. um, but that would allow that, that second unit to be added for an in-law, the boomerang child, yeah. you know, or just a rental over the garage, so you know you can help pay down your mortgage and Correct. whatever. But keep the residential but scale. Keep, keep the scale, um, adding density without really changing the fabric of the neighborhood. Correct. Right. That, that's actually a very interesting concept that Minneapolis is, I haven't read their whole plan yet, but they've just adopted a plan to allow, they're fine, nobody wants these big old houses anymore in these mm -hmm. older neighborhoods and they don't want to lose the residential character so they've, they've allowed them to go to two or three family units as long as the residential historic architecture is maintained at the street front. Um, I don't think we're ready for that yet here, but I think that's probably where preservation is going to be heading those discussions in the next mm -hmm. 15 years as, as taxes increase and bigger houses are harder to maintain. People don't want that. I think there's going to have to be some creative zoning um, options for these bigger houses. I agree with that. Okay. That, what I was trying to say. <laughs> say very well. Any other? Uh, are your your presentation is complete then? I'm good. Thank you. It's okay. An impressive job. To do it was. Yes. Thank it was you. a lot of work. It has been. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Um, unless any uh, new business. From anyone from the commission, Michael, public, public. no, okay. Um, uh, can I ask for a motion to adjourn? adjourn. So move, second by second. All in favor, aye. aye. Any opposed? Motion passes. Aye.